Greetings, Minecrafters, and welcome to another exciting Minecraft discussion on this glorious day. My name is Kimberly Quinn, and I'm here in northern Vermont with Giovanni, our golden retriever, taking a bit of a nap today because it's a, one of those rainy, drizzly, um, stay in and snuggle Sundays. And, uh, you know, just I'm not a huge napper, but it's definitely nice to just read a book kind of day or do a podcast kind of day. There you go. So today what I'd really like to talk about is exploring and possibly even committing to voluntary simplicity. And I want to do a shout out to Richard Carlson, PhD, because uh, that this is where my inspiration is coming from on this day, at least partially, because usually once I get rolling, I think of other other uh, people who I, you know, I read about, you know, read their, their stuff or listen to their YouTubes and things like that. And for right now, it's, it's him kicking us off. And he is also the, he is Dr. Richard Carlson is author, is the author of Don't Sweat the Small Stuff books. And there are a bunch of them. I own at least three or four. Uh, This one is Don't Sweat the Small Stuff with Your Family. He's got one with money, which is also very good. One that must have been his first one. I think it's just is what it is. Don't sweat the small stuff. And he's got another one. Don't sweat the small stuff in love. And anyway, and they're really super short. And with their own little daily things. S- similar but different to Sarah Von, Bre- Von Brethnick's Simple Abundance book. They're not the same kind of content or anything like that. But set up similarly in which the, the quote unquote chapters are like a page or page and a half. And very doable to start your morning off. Which... I'm all about it. I'm all about the positive affirmations and, and um, you know, getting my, my mindset right when I first wake up. So he's another one of those that, that's good to kick your day off. Or to, so let's just say this properly, to prime, to prime your day with, in addition to that hot tea in the gratitude journal. So Richard talks about this voluntary simplicity thing, which is also... It took me like, you know, 0.3 seconds here, I guess, because it, it, what he's talking about is very um, sort of similar to Greg McGowan's idea, concept, whatever, essential of essentialism. And of course, Greg McGowan, I've done some podcasts talking about his stuff too, with essentialism. And it's it's kind of really prioritizing. They're similar, but different. They're not exactly the same. Otherwise, they'd be exactly the same book and they're not. Not at all, Um, but it's similar in realizing, you know, the less is more thing might be cliche, though it really is true because the more we, more we have outside of us in our house and closets and drawers and all of that, that clutter outside causes clutter on the inside, mental health wise, it causes clutter in the mind. And Greg, Greg McGowan's book is, is similar though different talking about making plans for what is essential also to do in our lives, you know, we, those things we can scratch off the to-do list. It's just maybe tomorrow, maybe never. Right. So they are very similar. And so Richard talks about the, the voluntary simplicity as the name suggests, it, it involves sort of simplifying one's life by, by choice rather than out of need. You know, you're, you know, being, you know, life can just push us into things to get rid of things. Um, who know all different, all different reasons. We can just maybe not realize why our mood has been affected. I've done podcasts on that and that's definitely true. True for me. I'm not, a, I'm, though I'm not a moody person. I am sensitive to a lot of clutter. So if I, we start to build up stuff, I just, I, the way I realize it is I don't want to be in that room anymore and it doesn't have to be, I'm not talking about hoarding. I'm talking about just for me, cause I'm sensitive to it. I would rather just have the basic, basic, basics in a room. So when it picks up and there's things thrown over couches, and I'm also not a neat freak either, actually. Um, it's it's just a clutter thing for me. That's what it is. It hurts my head. So anyway, um, what was I saying? Uh, so to, oh, he says to, so this means, so rather to choose it rather than be pushed into it with, with whatever, however that happens, it means you put a ceiling on your material wants, you know, you just kind of declare it and not necessarily because not, not necessarily because you have to, or maybe you're being pushed by a partner or maybe a, a, a parent or a roommate or a sibling or whatever, but because you want to, and also because 
you're kind of, you become aware of the wisdom and the potential for inner peace that comes with decluttering a space. I mean, it's sort of an instant feel good. In fact, I remember way back when dinosaurs roamed the earth and glaciers were shifting and ferns covered everything. When I was at St. Mike's in undergrad and I, it, all the way through, but I, my memory for some reason is as a senior, which makes sense because that's when you have all the, you know, senior, now we call them capstones. We didn't call them then. We didn't call them that then, but all the senior projects and all that stuff and lots of tests and papers. And I was a pre-med. I had more tests, tests and then labs and things. But when you were, you know, when you got overwhelmed, when I would get overwhelmed with all this stuff, rather than, you know, head to a quiet study space, sometimes I would find myself cleaning my car because, and I, and I don't think I was aware of it at that time, but what that did for me is give me a sense of control when I was really feeling very out of control and overwhelmed and probably panicked a little bit. I don't mean in the exact, you know, sense of the world with diagnosis. I mean, in, in the moment, oh God, I, I, I put this off for so long and now I'm in trouble kind of thing. And, um, yeah, so, so I, I remember feeling pretty immediate relief when I would, you know, vacuum out, vacuum out my little Nissan Sentra and uh, armor all it and get everything out of it so it was completely looked like new. I feel like I had the world by the ass. And then I would go into my townhouse with my awesome roommates who were probably also flipping out for various reasons during finals week. And then we would all kind of talk about it. And then you just had, then you're reminded of everything. The car looks great, but you still have, you know, four tests in the next two and a half days and three labs. And uh, one of my roommates was an English major. So she was bogged down with, you know, 20 page papers and things like that. And then you put the pedal to the metal and you figure out, okay, get done what you can get done. And that's it. But at least when I'm driving around, I'm going to feel like I'm in control because my car looks good. In, in fact, that is another behavior I would engage in when I had lots of tests and everything due. Um, is I would go drive around. I would, and I would actually ride my bike way out there, deep, way over by snow when weather permitted. Uh, but I also would drive when weather didn't permit, which look, could seem like an avoidant behavior, maybe. But actually, I found when I got overstimulated like that, that taking that time away, as extroverted as I am, I love people. When I, when I, when things got to be too much, when the going gets tough, as I say, the tough go riding a bike or driving in a car. And that alone time did anchor me to be, to be truthful and then to get back at it. But anyway, I got a little tangential, but that's hashtag squirrel. All right. So circling back around to rich Richard, you know, he talks about, because it is true. I remember even having a wave of this way back then as a, as a college undergrad, even though I don't know that I actually verbalized it, but I remember, I remember, I definitely remember it feeling good. I felt like, wow. And often cleaning my car, I kind of was making light of it, making joke of it, making a joke of it earlier. But it, it also works for me now at a fabulous 58 in a different way. Even though I was cleaning my car, which did not a whole lot for, you know, as far as content for tests, tests that were happening in the next few days, but it was a mojo actually, because once I gained that sense of control, from from having that clean space, it did motivate me to start hammering away at other things. Uh, and so anyway, so Richard talks about the wisdom in it because this like aha moment goes on. Uh, wow, this feels good. My head feels a little more clear. I feel like I've sort of created some white space and uh, simplifying my car, simplifying the sock drawer. We can, you know, simplifying, let's say you're fast forward to having a family and all that and Fast forward to cleaning up, you know, closets and getting rid of stuff, just getting rid of, getting rid of it just feels so good. And he talks about, so all the wisdom of the, of the good feels, but also the potential for inner peace because the gratitude thing rolls in here because we, we can learn to be and have an awareness of kind of come into this awareness of being happy with what we already have, even after we've gotten rid of a shit ton of it what's left we can appreciate more because it's not cluttered under a pile of stuff i mean there's a there's a thing that i mean we all notice it right you go into a spa spas are great for this they'll have one gorgeous piece of artwork on the wall and that's it and they'll maybe have you know one little stand with a little jar of colorful rocks in it and those 
and the little tea lights that kind of weave in between the rocks, and that's it. And because it's so simple, it's so easy on the mind, and we're also able to see the beauty more easily because it's not there are not all kinds of knickknacks around, knickknacks everywhere. I actually, when I was a child, I I I knew someone. It was one of the houses that we used to go to. Um, I was like eight or something, and oh my god, there were just knickknacks everywhere. And even as a kid, I did again. I I don't know if I put all kinds of language to it, but I just it hurt my head as a kid. Couldn't move in there. The woman was like an artist of some sort, and she she painted little sculptures, little gnomes and stuff, and there were wall-to-wall gnomes in this house, like inside the house, not out in a in like a shed or something or even in a basement. They were just everywhere, stacked on top of pianos. They were all over. And I thought, like, I felt, I, I remember as a kid being in there, like, I felt like I couldn't breathe. It was just so, so cluttered. And Richard Carlson, PhD, makes another good point, which is that when we simplify our lives, it frees up time. If those are our valuable life minutes. And I know as uh, my husband and I, my beloved husband and I, are recent empty nesters of the Fab Five, our five amazing young adult kids, we're now, we now have uh, little Giovanni is napping next to me in his chair, our golden retriever, and we've got Hamlet, King Lear, and Caesar, the goats, and we're left with a big house with no kids in it. And a lot of work necessary downstairs, actually, because they haven't, you know, been in there for about, well, about a year and a half now, I guess, the last one left. And so it, it, I find that since afterwards, actually, the kids were really young adults, were very good about getting rid of their stuff when they left, because I'll tell you that the time, it, it would, now it's very, very Spartan down there. So it doesn't, take as much effort to whip through with a broom. Um, we don't do it as often to be truthful because we kind of, my husband and I kind of live upstairs because the kids' rooms are all downstairs. Not a lot of reason to be down there except for the exercise bike. But thankfully, we actually have guests coming. Um, we actually have guests coming uh, in a couple weeks and that's going to be our big motivator to go down there and sweep. But thankfully, because it's so Spartan now, it won't take that much time. If it were back in the day when the kids were all home and they were responsible for their own rooms and if anybody's had kids who obviously turn into teenagers, thankfully, right, um, they, you know, it takes a lot to keep up with that to get them to clean their own rooms and things. But, there, you know, there definitely was a lot, took a, it was a lot more time consuming when there was so much more stuff down there to keep it, you know, organized and 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 pleasant to be down there. It just took a lot more energy. Now that it's very, very, very Spartan, it's a quick sweep, a quick dust, and that's it. In fact, our youngest, I mean, I miss her, and I miss all five of them so much. The empty nest thing is for the birds. <laughs> Little podcast humor there. Um, it's uh, it's bittersweet. So I, my husband and I certainly love the time together, obviously, but I do miss them a lot. What I was about to say with my youngest is that, uh, who's now in Denver, is she used to go on these little like cleaning binges where she would cleaning slash decorating. So she would take, just take over a room downstairs and just morph it into something else. So she morphed one room into like a little mini gym. It's not really a gym. It just has two, it has a bike and a treadmill. And she, and she, and she found, she, she like her mom cannot stand a lot of stuff. So she'd rip everything out of there, find some cool little palm plant the two exercise bikes, a couple of mirrors done. And right before she left, she turned in one of the, one of the old bedrooms down there into a Zen den. And to, it's still, it's been over a year. It's, it's been about a year, I guess. A year in January for her, I guess. So I was wrong about the year and a half. It's been almost a year. This feels longer because we miss them so much. Um, but it's, it's still so simple. And it, it collects dust and things because, like I said, we're not down there as much. But it's a great place to read it as a bookshelf a little couch, a salt lamp, and a little faux fire faux fireplace you plug in. And I think there's one piece of art on the wall, if I remember right, being up here, and that's it. So it takes a sweep and a dust and done. Then Richard Carlson, PhD, uh, taps into, as far as the voluntary simplicity thing, he talks about the clutter thing, but he also talks about um, 
like I said, when you clean, when you, that's not just about cleaning, it's about decluttering, right? How it frees up time and also frees up money. I know when a few times we've, we've moved, we were kind of had to, well, one of the moves we had to store stuff in the, in the basement of where we work. So it was a really brief move. So we moved finally to Vermont and I ended up rebuying stuff. I mean, small stuff, rebuying, you know, spatulas, rebuying maybe certain like sweatpants, because when you can't find anything, you know, you end up rebuying stuff if it's a moving situation and it frees up your energy because you're saving your life minutes. Cause you're not running around, you know, doing all that stuff. And then he, then he moves into another way to simplify your life, which is by stopping to care about what we used to be called. I don't know if people say this phrase anymore because he wrote these books a while ago, but the keeping up with the Joneses situation and I'm originally from New York, and that's in New Paltz, about an hour out of Manhattan, and it's a very nice, nice area. And being only an hour out of Manhattan, I think there's a little bit of that New Yorker energy out there, a ton of art, artistic talent in that town, for sure. Um, just very beautiful, and uh, but it's got that, got a New Yorker vibe going on. And there was, there's definitely, even though, well, it's like, a, it's, it's also got a hippie thing to it. Anyway, that's not the point. The, the keeping up with the Joneses thing, I think it's a little bit of a generalization, but I think it's more of an urban and suburban thing than it is a rural thing because often in very, very rural areas, the economics are a little different. And certainly Vermont has some pockets that are socioeconomically compromised. And so when you say keep up with the Joneses, if that isn't necessarily true if the Joneses don't have much and there are definitely pockets of, of that up here where people, um, you know, so communities that such as that don't, you know, have as many resources are, are way more sort of naturally way more focused on their relationships and things like that, because there isn't the race to, to keep up and get the next nicest car, the next nice, you know, the iPhone 212 or whatever, because, they're not, you know, out here, we're not surrounded by that as much. Though, in, you know, I remember even way back when, again, when when Raptors were running around in middle school, there was definitely a thing, you know, the, the, way back in the late 70s, early 80s, the pants to have were called sweet oars with the wide pockets. And then you put your comb in your back pocket in seventh grade, and that was a big thing. And then in the 80s, that came, the, those white Nike sneakers, you had to have those. And the the skin tight designer jeans that we had, you practically have to roll on the floor to button them because that was the look. And, uh, you know, nowadays I, I remember when the kids were in high school, which is a while ago now, cause they're all in their twenties and want our oldest. Oh, we actually have two in our, their thirties now. I just thought of that. Caitlin just turned 30. So 30 and almost 32. So it was a while ago, but it was Amber Crombie and Fitch or whatever that was. And, um, American Eagle and, and, you know, there's all that stuff that goes on and then seasoned adult world that just takes on a different look, right? It takes on a different look for, you know, you know, you know, re or, or renovating houses, you know, the nicest, newest cars, the, um, the coolest vacations and all that stuff. And that can be a lot of pressure on people. And it's, it's strange. Well, cause now it's the end of October at this minute, these, these are released a little bit later, but as we approach the holidays, this whole conversation we're having gets, gets worse. And I, I remember is, you know, being a younger parent, uh, we didn't live up here. We lived in Northern New Jersey, which was very, at the time it's built up now, it was very rural and gorgeous. Um, but I remember the pressure, oh my gosh, the pressure on parents to keep up with all that. And, and now, and that was way before, that was before um, cell phones, pretty much. They were kind of just coming into it, like flip phones and things like that. But they weren't a thing, really. A lot of car phones still that were plugged in. Computers weren't that amazing yet. You know, they existed in America Online. But it wasn't, when our kids were small, it wasn't like it is now with all the gaming stations and all of it so expensive and you know, uh, and, and, you know, parents keeping up with that and their kids getting on a bus and they're hearing about what everybody else has, you know, got after, after Christmas or Hanukkah. And it's just, and, and before that all happens, before the day itself, the pressure's obviously on the, on the parents to try to keep up 
with all that. It's it's just so so one of the things Richard Carlson PhD talks about is doing your best you you can to kind of step out of that current. I think the holidays it's particularly hard. It, that's a that's a, a much tougher time, you know, because it's that provider pressure that's on parents and um you know the outside of that though, I mean it, Maybe to to I'm, I, to I'm you know maybe just tone it down a little bit, and I'm one to talk because I will fully admit that I we indulged our our kids at Christmas time. They were never spoiled, never because we we ran a tight ship as far as values go. But but during the holidays, I and that was me. It was both of us, but it was mostly me because um, that was coming from another place. That's another podcast for another time. But we definitely indulged them. And we can do, I look, when I look back, we could have toned, toned it down so much, but any, anyhow, as far as the rest of the time too, to really, you know, be a trendsetter and simplify because there'll probably be so many people around you who'll be grateful. Gosh. I mean, I think when I, again, when I look back to those early days, I would have been grateful to not have all that pressure. You know, if I was surrounded by a group of young moms who are like, Hey, you know what? We decided we're going to do five presents each this year or something. And there were a whole bunch of I, that, that influence would have hopefully, you know, taken hold on me and it would have been a, a much more peaceful, peaceful experience, I think. So Richard Carlson talks about this whole keeping up with the Joneses thing is kind of like continuing to just be running wildly and frantically on that proverbial treadmill, which is overwhelming and counterproductive, in addition to being stressful and time-consuming, and I'm going to add in really expensive. And he says, many of us have fallen into the habit of the ever-increasing wants, needs, and desires. He says, it seems that it seems that most of us believe that more is better, more stuff, things to do, experience, and so, so forth. And then he asks, but is it really? You know, but is it really? And the one thing I'll say, which is also a, a, a positive psychology thing, and Sean Aker in his book, The Happiness Advantage, talks about this. If, you know, as far as, you know, a healthier, you know, healthier, you know, better proactive, or say, let's say proactive mind health, if, if you're going to spend money, and this is definitely where I am at, at a fabulous 58. In fact, we, we get our young adults for Christmas now, we get, we get them Airbnb gift cards, and that's right where I'm going with this. So I would agree with him. With all the rest of this, the more stuff, which is eventually going to be in a yard sale, probably, right? All kinds of, you know, whatever, all kinds of material, whatevers. When, if you're going to spend money, spend it on experiences. Spend it on experiences. I don't mean that it has to be a Mediterranean cruise. I mean, if you can do that, good for you. But massages, um, which is still expensive and not in the same league as a cruise, right? To spend, um, take your best friend for lunch. You can make, you know... Do an, an artsy coupon of your own, you know, lunch for two, and you just and then you just take the bill when you go do it. And I, I know our, our kids used to do things like that when they were little and gave us Christmas presents. They would come up with really cute things. You know, like here's a coupon for doing the dishes once or something like that. I don't remember what they were now, but they were adorable. Um, and I, I remember my girls once made a coupon. I think it's for Mother's Day. To, for, for for like in our own living room spa experience. And it was probably the best spa experience I had in my life. They were little, they were probably like, you know, five, seven and nine, or maybe seven, nine and 11 or something like that. And one of them, they were all working on me at once too. One did my feet, my nails, and one did my nails on my hands. Another one was doing some, a facial that um, their dad must've helped with taking them to the store. There's like a from Rite Aid where you put the, the stuff on your face and you peel it off is, and, there was so much love and planning behind it. So it, it can be, you know, that, I mean, it's so endearing to, to when kids are able to do, do that stuff because it's something that they have to give too. And as grownups, we can do the same thing. You can do that for your partner. This, this coupon entitles you to a, a really fabulous candle at dinner and a massage, you know, or something like that. And then, you know, or maybe a day trip. You know, if you have, if you live next to an amusement park, which that is expensive, I guess, but a day trip to a museum, a day trip to wherever experiences are really what, what go the distance. So if you're going to spend it, spend it there. Then, uh, Richard takes it from there, uh, from this idea of having too much stuff, things to do and, you know, swapping over to experiences. I kind of add that part in. Then he takes it over to, you know, we can, we can 
we, we can allow ourselves to become, become conditioned. And we definitely, many of us are in the, in the U.S. And I love my country very much. It's just true that many of us fly around like gerbils on crack because we think we should, especially in my age range. The current Gen Zs are definitely not that way. They are definitely not that not that way. They they have a different idea of work life integration that we that we say now. Whereas um, those of us in my age range, you know, we're very conditioned to filling ourselves up with busyness. You know, if you weren't if you didn't leave after your boss, your job wasn't that important. If you didn't leave, stay late like that, you weren't proving yourself. You weren't showing you were invested. You know, sometimes working through your lunch hour, if you didn't take on extra stuff, if you didn't take stuff home with you, it's like prove yourself, prove, prove yourself, prove yourself. When was it over? You know, kind of thing. And and I'm not, I, I'm still, I'm st- my husband and I both have killer work ethics and I like my work ethic. I like his work ethic. I'm also saying that um, we don't need to fill ourselves up with busy just for the sake of filling ourselves up with busy. And I think the world, thankfully, has moved into a, especially with the pandemic, that has helped us a lot, moving into a, a healthier place with filling up with busyness and steering away from, you know, human beings transforming to human doings, because that isn't healthy. You know, feeling that you know we aren't, we are not enough unless we're doing something for somebody all the time. You know, that's just exhausting and unhealthy, and 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 you know contributes to burnout. And then we're like the giving tree, if you've ever read that book, the giving tree at the stump level. And you can't give what you don't have. We know that. So this is another way that Richard touches on this voluntary simplicity is to watch the schedule and create some white space just for you. And now with Google calendars, uh, I know myself, I, 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 I have caught, I think most people I know do, colleagues actually will stick, you know, random little things on the calendar that say meeting or busy or whatever to prevent meeting bombs from just filling up the whole day, you know, block in, you know, a block out, block in, however you want to look at it. Time for lunch, maybe time for a 15 or 20 minute walk in the afternoon to take a break, you know, put in meeting, you know, it could be a meeting with God. No one has to know you're not lying. Meeting with yourself. There you go. A little you time. And, and because it's healthier to take a break, it's healthier to not get meeting bombed all day long. It's just plain healthier. Voluntary simplicity at work. And lastly, Richard Carlson talks about, you know, this whole idea of voluntary simplicity is not one that's just for those who are financially comfortable. And I don't even mean the wealthy wealthy, just regular comfortable. Um, it's about decluttering and anybody can accumulate clutter and anyone can benefit from decluttering. Anybody can de- can benefit from from decluttering because it frees up the mind. It frees it creates white space and it makes our lives easier. And so he says that sometimes simplifying your life can involve major shifts, like choosing to live in a smaller, less expensive apartment or home rather than struggling to pay for a larger one. He says this decision can make your life less stressful because it will be far easier to pay your rent or or let's say a lower mortgage. Other common decisions involve things like eating more simply, sharing and passing on clothes to others, or saying no to more opportunities to do things. That one I got to interject a Greg McGowan there because in his um, his book Essentialism, he's a big fan of that, and he talks about how that can be the toughest one because when we're offered, it's e- okay, it's easy to to say no and simplify when it's an, a request or an ask of us that we don't want to do anyway, right? Would you like to come in and have a root canal? No, thanks anyway, right? When it's, would you like to come into work on Saturday and Sunday to help me clean the office? No, probs not. But when it's something that's a good opportunity and you've offered, you've been offered three of them, when you're already packed, he talks about you say no, no, and no, because we, we don't, we don't want to accept opportunities that are good that, that get us in a state of overwhelm, which prevents, prevents us from being great. Simplifying means holding in on one of those opportunities, saying yes to the one that you can, that you can absolutely crush it. Instead of spreading yourself thin to do three things half-assed, it's better to just hone in on the, that one essential thing 
and be great at it instead of just a little good at it. I love that about that book. So I wanted to throw that in here. And then uh, uh, Richard says... Okay, or saying no to more opportunities to do things. The idea, of course, is to make decisions that enhance your life in the sense of making it a little easier and a little less complicated. All right, so there we go. Embrace voluntary simplicity. This is Kimberly Quinn signing off from the beautiful rainy day in Vermont. Have a mindful day.